Chapter 14, The Jewish Epistles, Hebrews chapter 10, part 2, The Present Dilemma. The author of Hebrews, writing to Jews, appealed to their love for the past along with their longing for God's promise of national restoration in the future. Two of the primary groups addressed by this epistle struggled because of their Jewish heritage. Number one, the people in the first struggling group addressed by this epistle were almost trusting the Messiah, almost forsaking the Old Testament sacrificial system to trust in the one to whom the schoolmaster pointed, Galatians 3, 24 and 25. This group was likened to the individuals foretold by Christ when he spoke of those who, when they had heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth. For the word's sake, immediately they are offended, Mark 4, 16 and 17. The second struggling group addressed in this epistle had trusted in Christ for salvation but continued to struggle with how to make sense of the seemingly radical changes taking place concerning their Jewish heritage. The typical Christian struggles to understand the magnitude of any such conflict. It was this competing struggle that was prominently reflected in this epistle. It no doubt shaped the context of Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. Some Jews had made a public profession of faith in Christ, but did so without trusting in Christ as Savior. Luke identified this phenomenon when he recorded Christ's parable concerning the various soils and their reception and rejection of the truth. The book of Luke specifically stated, They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Luke 8 verse 13. Those addressed by the parables are no different from many Jews and Gentiles throughout the last two millennia since Christ's sacrifice of himself for man's sin. Additionally, Paul's letter to the Hebrews sought to encourage those who had believed to the saving of their souls. While that wording may seem awkward, the purpose seems to have been a push toward genuine faith as opposed to a shallow knowledge of and acceptance of factual information involved with the gospel of Christ. This distinction will be discussed in depth in another chapter covering the book of James. Sadly, far too many Jews with a faithless profession return to the religion of their fathers. They desired to return to the Levitical priesthood, the law of Moses, and the sacrificial system. Yet the newfound knowledge concerning Christ and his sacrifice left them further accountable to God, and a return to Judaism offered no hope because that meant a rejection of the saving grace of Christ. As Christ stated in his parable, they had no root. The average Gentile believer struggled to comprehend such a quandary because the law, Moses, the sacrificial system, held no real significance to them. However, a little perspective on the timing and the circumstances surrounding the Jews proves beneficial. The book of Hebrews was written approximately 30 years after the death of Christ while the temple was still standing and operable, Hebrews 13, 10, and 11. Many Jews were zealous for the law, Acts 21, 20, and proudly lived under the banner of Judaism. For the unconverted Jew, accepting Christ seemed to be a repudiation of Judaism. As such, Jewish people were severely persecuted when they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.32, But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Hebrews chapter 10, A Willful Sin. The book of Hebrews contains a definite past, present, and future focus upon Hebrews. Most non-Jews do not sufficiently understand the Jewish heritage to make sense of the teaching. Within the context of Hebrews chapter 10, two passages generally divide believers in matters of interpretation. Both passages will be explored herein. In summary, Paul expressed his refusal to draw back to the Old Covenant and warned that those who attempted to do so had no more sacrifice for sins. This is a simple fact for everyone, but struck a peculiar chord for the Jews familiar with the sacrificial system. Paul told these Jews who had received the knowledge of the truth that the only sacrifice was Jesus' sacrifice and nothing else. Jesus was the indisputable, all-sufficient sacrifice, and the Old Testament sacrificial system was null and void. Hebrews 10.26 For if we sin willingly after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. 
Paul addressed willful sin. He was certainly not stating that the Jewish sacrificial system was efficacious except in the case of willful sin. It is heretical for any Bible student to teach such nonsense. In fact, some 30 years prior to the writing of Hebrews, the Savior had already made it clear that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man came unto the Father but by him, John 14, 6. With this basis in mind, the concept of a willful sin needs further exploration. In the most basic sense, a willful sin is one committed purposefully. Yet the meaning here must take on greater significance since every sin is, at least to some degree, a sin of the will. To fully understand this sin contextually, one must consider three facts. Number one, the sin followed knowledge. And two, the sin left man with no more sacrifice for sins, but rather an expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And three, it was exemplified in the lives of the Old Testament Jews who knew the law, but despised it as evidenced by their actions. The Jews in danger of the willful sin were Jews who knew that Jesus was the Christ. They knew that his sacrifice was the only means of salvation. They knew the Old Testament sacrificial system was incapable of atoning for their sins. To draw back to the old system was a willful and unbelieving sin that rejected the truth that they knew to be true. These Jews knew that sin's payment was made by Christ and by him alone. In fact, earlier in the book of Hebrews, Paul had addressed the lack of efficacy of the sacrifices under the law. These sacrifices under the law could not make anyone perfect, Hebrews 10.1, could not satisfy God, Hebrews 10.5 and 6, and could not and would not please God, Hebrews 10.6. It was clear to those who had received the knowledge of the truth that the law could not save anyone. This is the definition of truth. Rejecting this knowledge concerning Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice left the Jew with two great predicaments. Number one, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And number two, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. These facts had to be offensive and yet quite profound to any unsaved Jews who loved their Jewish mode of worship and wanted to remain dedicated to it regardless of Christ's sacrifice. The newfound knowledge brought with it a profound accountability to God. At least to a certain extent, the truth of Acts 17.30 applied to a Jew desiring to return to the Old Covenant. The times this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Furthermore, it was the truth that was taught by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5.4 when he said, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Paul was not claiming that anyone could be justified by the law. That was an impossibility. Although this passage from Galatians has also been frequently misconstrued, the statement itself is quite straightforward. An individual either trusted Christ and the grace offered through Christ or sought to be justified by the law. There was no middle ground or gray area. One could not have it both ways. Man cannot now, nor could he ever be, justified in God's sight by a combination of grace and works or faith and works. Only by misinterpreting difficult passages can anyone arrive at such a conclusion. Historically, God's favor and mercy had been granted to those who obediently partook of the old covenant by faith. Their faith in the revelation God had given brought fellowship with God and withheld God's judgment until Christ's sacrifice paid for the redemption of the transgressions that was under the First Testament, Hebrews 9.15. Those now attempting to maintain allegiance to the law meant a rejection of the one to whom the law pointed. For that reason, Paul warned that it was Christ or nothing. The Jew reading this epistle had been exposed to knowledge superior to that of the forefathers. He knew of Christ and the all-sufficient sacrifice. There was nothing left of the sacrificial system to which he could return that would benefit him in any way, Hebrews 10.6. There was no more sacrifice for sins on the law. The same holds true today. Any Jew rejecting Christ's sacrifice had nothing to which to return, but instead gained a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation, Hebrews 10.27. He could no longer cling to his Jewish heritage as a means by which he had special access to God. Rejection of God's Son made the Jew an adversary to God and promised certain judgment. Some want to offer the Jews a special exemption, but Jews who die without trusting Christ die as enemies of God, like any unsaved Gentiles, Romans 3.9. During the first century, God was showing the Jews 
their hopelessness under the law, and their sacrificial system. If that were not sufficiently terrifying for the Jew, this willful sin is likened to the Old Testament Jews' rejection of the law of Moses. Some of the Jews came out of Egypt simply because they saw the signs performed by Moses. Yet they remained faithless and unbelieving. They crossed the Red Sea and eventually learned of God's law. Yet they showed their faithlessness by despising Moses' law. Hebrews 10.28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Like the faithless Jews in the wilderness, many Jews in the first century who followed Jesus and later followed the apostles only did so because they witnessed the signs and wonders. The scriptures acknowledge as much in John. A great multitude followed him, that is Jesus, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased, John 6, 2. Yet during both the ministry of Christ and later, some Jews rejected the knowledge they had received concerning Christ. In doing so, they assured themselves of punishment. It is important to note that punishment is something God reserved for his enemies, which included unbelieving Jews, Matthew 25, 46, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, 2 Peter 2, 9, and also Hebrews 10, 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. God does not punish believers. The word punish is limited to unbelievers, while the Bible uses chastening, Hebrews 12, 11, to describe God's dealings with the saved who are disobedient. This is a very important distinction. The punishment due to the Christ-rejecting Jew is both unique and responsive. It is unique in that it is sorer than the punishment of those who despised Moses' law. This is true because the knowledge possessed by these Jews exceeded the knowledge possessed by those familiar with the law and ignorant of Christ. Additionally, their rejection is a direct rejection of God himself, as opposed to rejection of his truth. This progression is demonstrated in principle in the parable of the man who planted a vineyard, Mark 12, 1 through 12. When the Son of God was rejected and killed, the Lord of the vineyard promised to come and destroy the husband and give the vineyard unto others, Mark 12, 9. The punishment mentioned in Hebrews also reflects the severity of the threefold sin of the unbelieving Jews. First, they had trodden underfoot the Son of God. Second, they had counted the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. Lastly, they did despite under the spirit of grace. This threefold rejection is directly associated to the three rejections of the Son of God, the blood of Christ, and the spirit of grace. Every time the Bible uses phrases like trodden underfoot, it suggests something that is judged, rejected, or thought to be meaningless and inadequate. This phrase in Hebrews expresses the complete disdain that the Christ-rejecting Jew held for God's Son. Additionally, these rejectors of Christ consider the blood atonement an unholy thing. This terminology reflects the importance of the blood in the Old Testament sacrificial system and suggests that for a man to count the blood of Christ an unholy thing was to reject its ability to atone for his sins. Lastly, doing despite under the Spirit of grace shows a rejection of the work of the Spirit of God in convincing men of sin and pointing men to the grace of God. This parallels the truth taught by Paul in Galatians. Galatians 5, 4, Christ has become of none effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. The truths in Hebrews expressed here should be sufficient to show that the man who committed such sins was unbelieving and therefore unsaved. However, one additional phrase must be addressed to show the fallacy of forcing false teachings into Bible interpretation. The phrase in question appears in the heart of Hebrews 10.29 and is wherewith he was sanctified. This sanctification does not refer to the man committing these sins as being sanctified or set apart since no lost man is ever said to be sanctified by the blood of Christ. The blood sanctified every man justified thereby. But the blood of the covenant also sanctified or set apart Jesus Christ from all others. In fact, it is that very truth that is conveyed repeatedly in Paul's epistles to the Hebrews. Christ and his blood were sanctified from all others. Hebrews 9.12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, 
purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 10, 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The blood of Christ was sanctified from the blood of mere bulls and goats. As has been repeatedly stated, difficult or unclear passages should never be interpreted contrary to the light received from the clear and obvious truths of Scripture. Yet all cults and schisms use this very tactic to make themselves unique from all others. The unclear should be defined by the clear and obvious, not the other way around. Indisputably, the epistle to the Hebrews and elsewhere teaches that a man who is sanctified by the blood of Christ never loses that sanctification. If that is true, the one sanctified by the blood in Hebrews 10.29 is by default Jesus Christ, the blood of the covenant wherewith he, that is Christ, was sanctified. It is certainly not referring to someone who was once sanctified and lost this position unless the Bible contains contradictions, which it does not. If anyone is sanctified and loses his sanctification, this event would contradict verses like the following. Hebrews 10.10 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Hebrews 10.14 For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. If these truths were not sufficiently clear, the Old Testament quotations found in Hebrews 10.30 should settle any remaining uncertainties. This verse from Hebrews contains two quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32. Hebrews 10.30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Deuteronomy 32.35, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense, their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. Obviously, the two quotes found in Hebrews 10.30 are derived from Deuteronomy 32.35-36. While we cannot cover the entirety of Deuteronomy chapter 32, it is imperative that one understands the overarching theme of that chapter and how it relates to the 10th chapter of Hebrews. The passage in Deuteronomy testifies of God's frustration with the nation of Israel. They rejected him for gods that could not save even after all that he had done for them. Consider the following overview. Number one, the appeal for the Lord. He is the rock. His work is perfect. Deuteronomy 32.4. Number two, the corruption of Israel. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation, Deuteronomy 32, 5. Number three, this is how they repaid the God who brought them out of Egypt. Did ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee, Deuteronomy 32, 6? See also Deuteronomy 32, 7 through 14. Number four, Despite all God had done for them, they forgot him. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee, Deuteronomy 32, 18. Number five, Israel's rejection of God moved God to reach out to the Gentiles. I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people, Deuteronomy 32, 31. Number six, except for the impact upon God's reputation, he would have altogether destroyed the Jews lest they, the adversaries, should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. Deuteronomy 32.27 Number 7. Israel's rejection of God made them no different than Sodom and Gomorrah. Their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Deuteronomy 32.32 32. Number 8. Israel's departure from the true God led him to lead them to the gods in which they trusted. He shall say... Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? Deuteronomy 32, 37. Number nine, although in the immediate Israel's behavior would bring his judgment, there would come a time of future restoration. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he, and it continues, will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Deuteronomy 32, 43. And then number ten, Israel's entire problem stemmed from their lack of faith. I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Deuteronomy 32.20 
While the emphasis of Hebrews chapter 10 is directed more toward the individual Jew rather than the national Israel, the truth applies to the Jews individually and collectively. The God who had delivered the Jewish forefathers from Egypt and given them the land in which they dwelt had now given them his son, Jesus Christ. Rejecting Christ as Messiah and Savior was no way to repay God for all that he had done for them. Their faithless rejection of Christ left them to their own devices. From God's perspective, the Jewish sacrificial system had already been invalidated. Although it would still be a few years before God would allow Titus to physically dismantle the temple, Although God will eventually reconcile Israel, their rejection of Christ in the immediate would cause them to be no different from any unbelieving Gentile. In other words, both unbelieving Jews and Gentiles are individually without hope, without favor before God, and are in fact his enemies. Romans 3.9, Romans 5.10, Romans 11.28, Philippians 3.18. It appears that Paul's epistle to the Hebrews served as the final ultimatum. It was Christ or nothing. The sacrificial system had served its purpose. The schoolmaster had come. Christ made the sacrifice and ascended to the Father's right hand till all his enemies would be put under his feet. To pursue the old covenant was rebellious. It was idolatrous. They were to turn from that system and place their faith in the finished work of Christ or else. In fact, a few years later, God would remove any perceived option of a return to the sacrificial system by allowing the temple and sacrificial system to be destroyed. For nearly 2,000 years, the Jews have been without a sacrificial system with the intent that they would trust the only sacrifice available, the death of Christ on the cross. Hebrews chapter 10, if any man draw back. With this introduction in mind, attention now turns to the proper interpretation of the concluding verses of Hebrews chapter 10. The opinions and ideas offered by believers concerning the teaching are almost innumerable. Some teachers point to verse 38 and 39 as proof of the loss of one's salvation. Amongst this group, another major divide exists with some teaching a possible loss of salvation in the present age, while others designate both the application and salvation's vulnerability to a future age. This last group claims that these verses refer to those who endure to the end, Matthew 24, 13 of Daniel's 70th week, and that those who endure have works involved in their salvation. Most assuredly, the passage teaches nothing of the sort. Hebrews 10, 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Footnote number one. Refer to When the End Begins, pages 81 to 84, by the same authors for discussion of what endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, signifies in Matthew. The context of being saved in Matthew chapter 24 refers to the flesh being saved at the second coming by those who do not die at the hands of the beast. Nine verses later in Matthew, we read, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened, Matthew 24, 22. The context is physical salvation, and the Bible believers need to always allow the context to determine the meaning. Additionally, we should always apply a consistent hermeneutic. Paul does not teach through Hebrews concerning the loss of salvation either in this age or in any to come. In fact, proper interpretation of the subject passage starts in Hebrews chapter 2 where the Bible warns, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Hebrews 2, one. A few verses later, Paul warns the recipients. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hebrews 2, 3. While not utilizing the words draw back, both passages indicate the same behavior with the words slip and neglect and the phrase draw back. The warnings continued into the next chapter of the Hebrews epistle. For example, Hebrews 3, 6, the scripture says, Whose, that is Christ's house, are we if we hold fast the confidence, the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Later, the Hebrews were warned, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, Hebrews 3.12. And we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, Hebrews 3.14. While we will deal with these passages in greater detail in a later chapter of this work, the context sheds some light on our study by showing that many of the Jews who escaped Egypt did so because they saw the signs. 
yet they failed to enter the land of promise because of unbelief, Hebrews 3.19. If these writings were not sufficient, Paul's letter offers additional admonitions when he said, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it, Hebrews 4.1. How could that happen? The answer, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief, Hebrews 4.11. Furthermore, the audience was admonished. Let us hold fast our profession, Hebrews 4.14, with concern, if they shall fall away, Hebrews 6.6. The writer of Hebrews and his companions expressed their hopes when saying, We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, Hebrews 6.11, desiring instead that they be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises, Hebrews 6.12. Furthermore, in Hebrews chapter 10, the scriptures warn, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10.22, and let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, Hebrews 10.23, and cast not away therefore your confidence, Hebrews 10.35. Consider the sum of these truths, slipping, Hebrews 2.1, neglecting, Hebrews 2.3, not holding fast, Hebrews 3.6, departing, Hebrews 3.12, not holding one's confidence steadfast, Hebrews 3.14, coming short, Hebrews 4.1, not holding fast one's profession, Hebrews 4.14, falling away, Hebrews 6.6, 6, not showing diligence to the full assurance of hope, Hebrews 6.11, not drawing near with a true true heart and full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10.22, wavering, Hebrews 10.23, and casting away, Hebrews 10.35. These all correspond to the words, draw back, as found in Hebrews 10.39. In fact, this seems to be the focal point of the epistle. Any type of token acceptance of the truth of the gospel or profession without possession is not sufficient to secure one's eternal life. Many demonstrated such acceptance of the truth and offered such professions, but the gospel of Christ was to be believed to the saving of one's soul. True salvation was not merely a profession or some outward change before salvation. That's a type of anti-scriptural lordship salvation. Instead, salvation is a complete inward change that should yield a lasting change in actions and behavior, even with peaks and valleys. This is the heart of the passage, and the contrast is clear from the start. Hebrews 10, 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. From the outset, one must take note of the contrasting terminology, especially as pertaining to the pronouns. A man who believes to the saving of his soul is just and therefore lives by faith. A man who refuses to believe to the saving of his soul draws back from what he knows to be true. This person cannot please God and ultimately finds that he has drawn back under perdition. For us to gain the truest biblical understanding of these contrasts, we must focus upon the specific pronoun's usage. Paul wrote we, which means he conspicuously included himself, his companions, at the time of the writing of his epistle, and potentially his primary intended audience in the group that believed to the saving of the soul. He also used the pronoun them, which excluded himself, his companions, and others who had believed to the saving of the soul from those who had drawn back into perdition. There's a chart on page 227 which delineates the pronouns. Consider the implications of such truths. Footnote number two. Those who make a salvific distinction between the faith of Romans 1.7 and his faith, Habakkuk 2.4, state that works had to be added to the Old Testament man's faith. Thus, salvation in the Old Testament was his faith plus works. Unfortunately, for those who have bought into this premise, this man-made philosophy contradicts the teaching here in Hebrews where these teachers make the same claim of faith plus works. The problem arises when one realizes that the quote in Hebrews matches the quote in Romans, not his faith of the Old Testament. Again, Bible believers need to always allow the context to determine the meaning and apply consistent rules of interpretation. If salvation were a process to be earned, either past, present, or future, Paul could not have definitively excluded himself and others from the group who drew back under perdition. In fact, he could not have conclusively claimed such until after the end of his life because he would have lacked any assurance of salvation. If these passages apply to Daniel's 70th week, which 
They do not exclusively. The same truth applies to the intended recipients of the epistle when it was written. With that in mind, we can boldly declare that these passages do not teach the loss of salvation, but rather distinguish between the saved and the lost. Before developing the truths concerning the condemnation of the unsaved, consider the impossibility of relegating this passage exclusively to a future period and people group. Within the context of Hebrews chapter 10, Paul obviously addressed an audience living at the same time. Specifically, Paul commended those who had compassion upon me, that is Paul, in my, that is Paul's bonds. Footnote number three. See Paul's other references to his being in bonds in his other prison epistles, Ephesians 6.20, Philippians 1.7, Philippians 1.13 and 14, Philippians 1.16, Colossians 4.3, Colossians 4.18, 2 Timothy 2.9, Philemon 10, and Philemon 13. This address to those contemporary with Paul is only possible if his audience was alive in the first century. Those who would attempt to teach otherwise do damage to the scripture. Hebrews 10.34, For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Clearly, the proper interpretation excludes the loss of salvation, past, present, or future. The proper interpretation also must have applied to first century individuals, also extending into the present and future. This leaves only the need to confirm the correlation between a man rejecting salvific faith and his inability to please God and ultimately his resulting perdition. The Jewish people were accustomed to the goodness and blessings of God. That nation, more than any other nation in the past, enjoyed God's favor and affection. Balaam, the false prophet, learned this truth. Balaam, hired by Balak to curse Israel instead, saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, Numbers 24.1. Samuel boldly expressed these same sentiments. The Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. 1 Samuel 12.22 And yet, while these things are true, there are some other requirements before one can truly please the Lord. For example, the psalmist expressed, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, Psalm 147.11. Furthermore, in the very chapter often entitled the Hall of Faith, Paul wrote, Without faith it is impossible to please him, Hebrews 11.6. Doctrinally speaking, all unsaved people displease the Lord, Romans 8.8. 8. At the same time, every saved person, based on his position in Christ, does please the Lord, Romans 8, 9. Some may argue that point, yet the ability to please the Lord or find acceptance in him is based solely on the merits of his Son. God the Father said from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, Matthew three seventeen, and then moved Paul to say, Wherein he, that is God the Father, hath made us, that is the saints, accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1, 6. Doctrinally speaking, one's position in Christ pleases God the Father. Practically speaking, this remains a daily struggle to make this a practical reality. Regardless, it is positionally and practically impossible for any lost person to please God. The Bible student knows this truth as it applies to an unsaved Gentile. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, Ephesians 2.12. This truth is a bit more problematic for an unsaved Jew who might believe that his acceptance is based upon some sort of birthright. Although God had historically taken pleasure in the nation of Israel, their rejection of the Son of God and God's offer of salvation through his Son placed the Jew in the same standing as any unsaved Gentile. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. This truth should have pointed the knowledgeable Jew to Isaiah chapter 53, where the scripture says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him, that is, Jesus Christ. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Isaiah 53.10 Although we were created to bring God pleasure, we cannot do so until we become accepted in his Son, Revelation 4.11. Anyone rejecting God's Son lost any opportunity to bring any pleasure to the Lord. If that were not bad enough, those who faithlessly drew back from their profession drew back unto perdition. 
The word perdition is only found eight times in Scripture and offers insight into its meaning. The first mention involves Judas Iscariot and pinpoints him as the only lost apostle calling him the son of perdition, John seventeen twelve. The last two mentions talk of the beast to come in Daniel's 70th week and prophesies that he will go or goeth into perdition, Revelation 17, 8 and 11. One of the middle references found in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 talks of the coming man of sin, identifies him as the son of perdition. While all these verses are insightful and helpful, they do not conclude what it meant when an unsaved Jew drew back from Christ to again trusting in his Judaism. However, God offers light. According to Philippians 1.28, the terror brought on by the adversaries of the gospel was to them, that is the adversaries, an evident token of perdition, but to the saints of salvation. Along these same lines, Peter said, The heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 2 Peter 3, 7. In other words, perdition is always associated with and a companion to the judgment God pours out upon those who reject his saving grace. Physical lineage offers no escape from those who reject God's Son. No one who is saved from perdition can ever do anything to lose that position, and if they could, then there's no eternal security for anyone while still alive. This is the end of chapter 14.